if gold breaks out, I don't think it just goes marginally higher. I think we, we are dealing with a moment where people realize that they need a safe haven like that or they need to protect themselves against a vanishing dollar. Um, and, and that takes gold to a much higher level. This is Kaiser Johnson with Liberty and Finance, and this is the Miles Franklin Weekly Special for June 6th through June 13th, 2023, while supplies last. This week we feature the 2023 quarter ounce Noah's Ark silver coins at $3.25 over melt per coin, and Ital Preziosi 10 ounce silver bars at just $3.49 over spot per ounce. Minted by the famed Geiger Mint in Germany, the quarter ounce Noah's Ark silver coins are sovereign coins of Armenia, with a face value of 100 dram, and a great way to get fractional silver for a significantly lower premium than you would normally pay. Next, our Ital Preziosi 10 ounce silver bars not only maintain a great level of liquidity, but also boast one of our lowest premiums in several months, at $3.49 over spot per ounce. They come individually numbered, are available in any quantity, and come 50 to a box. Our specials this week are IRA eligible. And if you'd like to learn more about a precious metals IRA, call us, and we'll be happy to help you in that process. To order our specials or any of the many other options we have available, call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. We're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you. Hey everyone, this is Elijah K. Johnson with Liberty and Finance. And with us today, our good friend, Lobo Tigre, the independent speculator. Lobo, thank you so much for joining us today. Happy to be back. There's plenty to talk about. Well, there definitely is, and it's great to have you. Our viewers always enjoy our interviews with you. I did want to discuss uh, first, obviously, the news of the week has been you know, uh, Biden signing the debt ceiling deal, which is kind of funny because it's not even really a raising of the debt ceiling to my understanding. It's more of a suspension until the, uh, uh, you know, after the presidential election. So it, it seems to be one of the most, uh, I guess, honest solutions to the debt uh, problem that we've seen. It's always been a theater, it seems like. But, you know, this time they're just saying, oh, we're not going to worry about it until after the election. So your perspective on that and how it impacted the markets. Well, the honest solution would have been for the U.S. to default. That's that's really what it amounts to raising the debt ceiling is breaking a promise raising the debt ceiling borrowing more is not america paying its bills it's america not paying its bills if it paid its bills it wouldn't need to borrow more the analogy here is uh you know the average joe running out of room on his credit card and deciding himself to raise his own credit limit on his credit card that's not good for the average joe and it's not good for a sovereign either there's, you know, the conventional wisdom as well. We can always print dollars so that, you know, the U.S. can't default. So there's no problem. Well, there is a problem, as everybody in your audience knows well. You, know, you print dollars and that has consequences. So many different rabbit holes we can go down there. But I think that the takeaway is, you know, things happen pretty much as we expected, right? You know, there was all this hype, as there always is, about, oh, what a catastrophe will be. And the Democrats really played that up, trying to gain leverage, uh, you know, with uh, people in the administration getting up and giving testimony. What about a catastrophic thing it would be if the U.S. didn't pay its bills, which it isn't doing. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, much, much hype and hoopla. And they did what they always do. I mean, it's slightly different flavor instead of just raising it to a certain amount. But actually, what they did is worse by just suspending it means they can spend all they want. They can they can rack up even more debt before they come around to raising it after the elections. The only thing surprising about all this to me is that there weren't more Republicans who decided to vote against this. And I understand that, you know, centrist, and, but you, you didn't need to have the majority of one party or the other. There was enough in the middle to make this pass. I get that. But I'm kind of surprised that there weren't more Republicans opposed to this because, I mean, think about what they did. They suspended it until after the election. Who does that help? I think it helps Biden more than it helps the challengers. If the thing blew up on Biden's watch, then I think, you know, people, they can blame the Republican. The, the Dems can re blame the GOP as much as they want. But the fact is that it would be happening under the current president's watch. And that, I think, would be bad for him. So um, the cynic in me I'm not saying expected default, but the cynic in me thought that there would be more appetite 
to push this puppy over the cliff and see what happened because it would hurt the other side more. Uh, so it's, a, it's interesting that that didn't happen. Um, I don't care to speculate on, on why that might be. But the takeaway for us as investors is this is bad. It's disguised as good news, but it's bad. But the prices won't be paid until later down the road, by and large. Uh, so, uh, you know, take it, take it for what's like, basically, let's move on. Like, we knew this was going to get happen one way or the other. It happened. It's one of those short term noise sources in the market. Now we can get back to what's going on with the economy and the Fed and things that actually do impact our investments, like now, not just somewhere. Yeah, I think definitely the national debt is an issue. Um, but as it, it it's not going to have an impact maybe now or even next year or so. This is something that could could go on for quite a while. Your perspective on that, I guess, uh, with respect to the debt, because, you know, it is ballooning out of control. It seems like the interest on the debt as, you know, uh, treasury bonds roll over and everything is going to get more and more. Um, so what really is the impact of that in your mind? Uh, I'll answer, Elijah, but as always, I need to remind you and the audience that I'm a due diligence guy. What my clients pay me for is independent, unbiased evaluations of stocks up or down, the good, the bad, the ugly, and telling the truth about it, whether they want to hear it or not. <laughs> I'm not an economist. Uh, that having been said, I, I would agree to some degree with the mainstream in that the absolute amount of debt by itself isn't really the key variable. I mean, it's scary to hear about $50 trillion in the next couple decades. But it's the debt to GDP ratio. If you conceivably, you know, AI or whatever grew the economy so wonderfully that the jet to debt to GDP ratio actually went down in that time, then fundamental economics tells us that's an improvement. So it's not just the absolute debt amount. Uh, that having been said, I'm not bearish on the economy growing that much. The, the we can grow ourselves out of this mantra has been demonstrably false over the last decades that we've been blowing out this this debt. And so I can't tell you, here's the blow up date, Elijah, you know, here's when the, when the brown stuff hits the fan. But I can say that I, I'm also in agreement with the people who point out that, you know, tons and tons of debt was seemingly fine when interest rates were zero or effectively zero. That's not fine at 5%. And um, the U.S., even Trump was talking about, oh, we should borrow more. You know, it's free money. We should borrow it, right? We, the government, we should take advantage of all this free money. But they borrowed short, right? If they could have locked in longer term rates, if the government could have borrowed long at, at historically low rates, we'd have a very different conversation. Right now, we have the government rolling over a bunch of short term debt. At what was effectively zero, you know, a year ago is now 5%, 4%, 3%, even 3%. There's a huge difference. And if you look at a chart of the uh, federal government's debt payments, it's it's spiking vertical. That is clearly not sustainable. So uh, I'm not enough of an economist to say when that becomes critical, when something blows up. But I think that is something to watch when... Uh, you know, even even the powers that be begrudgingly admit from time to time that you know that that payment issue is, but but everything's going to be fine. Inflation's coming down, um, but what if it doesn't come down? And and what if uh, you know Powell needs to pivot to prevent the government from being unable to pay its bills, regardless of the debt ceiling? And uh, you know, inflation is still high. So I think you know there's there's. Um, there's bad things happening now, and I think over the next year, those will become more evident. When, when this whole thing blows up, I don't know. Uh, but my outlook remains for recession, and I think that becomes the excuse for the Fed to start easing up, even if, you know, behind closed doors, the, the real reason is, is holy cow, we, we can't let these debt payments balloon this way or, or we're out of business. Now, when it comes to the recession, what investments do you think will fare well and what which ones won't? I think most will be farewell, as in farewell. There goes my money. <laughs> um, you know, clearly it's it's a, it's a difficult thing because the world has gone crazy. And the last time somebody asked me this question and I was bold enough to give an answer, uh, 2020 happened. And uh <laughs> 
I was kind of right in that gold eventually did well, right? We, we got the, that big spike, and not, not even eventually. Gold did well after the crash. Um, but I really thought that the recession would not be resolved that quickly, that a lot of you know, conventional businesses, even so-called defensive businesses would be hurt a lot more than they were. It makes me kind of reluctant to go way out on a, on a limb here with you, Elijah, and make any grand old predictions. I do think that gold and silver will do well in this recession. I think a recession at a time of still high inflation is going to remind people of the 70s. Now, it's very different from the 70s. Things don't have to happen now as they did because of the 70s. But when people are, are grasping for what to do and they're asking the same question you just asked me, they're going to look around and say, well, what happened last time? Or when will we see in similar circumstances? And so you could see, never mind the fundamentals, you could see just a self-fulfilling prophecy push gold and silver much higher in this environment. If nothing else is working, then even the much hated pet rock could actually end up sparkling again. Um, but I actually think the fundamentals are on our side here, too. I, I think uh, real rates are still going to remain low. They may actually go negative again if inflation pops up and the Fed pauses. And I think uh, well, the whole interest rate thing is another question. But, but I do think the inflation will remain high. And I think that environment is very constructive, as the mainstream analysts say, for what they're bullish on. Um, I'm generally skeptical on anything else. I'm, I'm right now. I've told my clients that I'm not buying any copper or lithium or anything else, even even if they look bullish longer term, even oil, uh, which I which I'm very bullish on after the short term. I'm not buying any of that stuff because the recession, a recession, historically always whacks commodities prices, even if they're already under the cost of production, they get whacked. The only exception here, uh, as you probably would guess, the audience has heard me say before, is uranium. And that's not because I'm claiming that uranium is recession proof, though I think there's a case to be made for it to be quite resistant because it's baseload power. Right? You, you, it's not optional. You don't, have a, you don't put uranium in your Mr. Fusion in the, in the flying car to go visit grandma. Uh, right? you, you needed to keep the lights on at hospitals and airports and things like that or your home. Uh, so I do think that makes it much more recession resistant than oil. Um, but on top of that, it's just it, it's a bigger conversation than we maybe want to have now. Uh, but the fundamentals have been bullish for a long time and the technicals are now bearing that out. And the narrative is now there. I mean, it was, when you have even the Biden administration pushing for advanced nuclear and Europe, despite Germany's objections, pivoting towards nuclear and BRICS countries building reactors as fast as they can. Uh, the demand is really very strong and growing going forward. And the price right now is still below the average cost of production. And the key thing, the one I've been telling people to watch for is the long-term contracting. The end users, the utilities are finally sitting down with the miners to sign long-term contracts. And these are coming in at higher prices. So if that happens, even in a recession, you know, a, a utility buying uranium for the next five years it, they're, they're not worried about the recession this year or even in 2024. They still need that secure supply, which they can't get on the spot market. So uh, I, I think there's a pretty good chance that uranium not only heads higher this year, but heads higher even in the face of a recession. I think that's a very interesting point. It, it, yeah, I mean, it seems like the demand for uranium would be more inelastic because, as you mentioned, it's not like people are just going to stop using it if if we hit a recession like they may, you know, use less oil or something like that. I mean, the uranium, uh, you know, nuclear reactors and stuff like that um, will still be running probably just as much. Well, I suppose if you had a nuclear plant right next to a bunch of aluminum smelters or other big energy draws that were then shuttered because of the economy. You know, on, on that kind of scenario, you might see a plant throttled back. Um, off the top of my head, though, I can't think of one that that that's it. That's all they supply. You know, if if they if their uh, commercial um, customers pull back, then they can supply. I, I would get you know it goes into the grid, and other more expensive suppliers to the grid would scale back before nuclear. Um, yeah, so <laughs> I, I'm very bullish. I, I've said it's been a bit controversial because, you know, my gold button friends get mad at me. 
Um, but I'm more confident of higher uranium prices this year than I am gold. But I think, you know, to assuage my gold bug friends, I think if gold breaks out, it doesn't just go higher. Like uranium can go higher to 60 or 70 bucks, and that would be plenty to incent new supply to come online. Um, whereas if gold breaks out, I don't think it just goes marginally higher. I think we, we are dealing with a moment where people realize that they need a safe haven like that or they need to protect themselves against a vanishing dollar. Um, and, and that takes gold to a much higher level. The new nominal all-time highs are the least of it. We could see real all-time highs, uh, which pushes it closer to 3,000. You know, uh, That can be your clickbait headline if you like. I'm not predicting $3,000 gold. I'm just saying if it really breaks out, I could see gold delivering much bigger gains for speculators in the stocks than uranium. But absent a, a, a Chernobyl type event, I, I just see uranium as extremely solid. This has to happen and it, we can see it happening now. This isn't just a someday, some when, you know, our famous Rick Rule quote, forget about the inevitable, you know, don't confuse it with imminent. And, and my add on to that is I don't even care about imminent. I want happening. This, this is something that's happening now. Uranium is having a great year. When it comes to gold, I did want to ask you about that. The reasons that you see gold rising, because you just wrote, wrote an article and mentioned how the conventional wisdom that gold prices are negatively correlated with real interest rates. It's more complicated than that. And actually, recently, we haven't been seeing that. So uh, could you touch on that and then also discuss for our viewers, you know, what are the fundamental reasons that you see that are going to be pushing gold higher? Well, it's kind of I've, I've been scratching my head a little bit on this, not just I mean, we're always wondering, you know, what's the perfect equation? How can we best pre predict the price of gold? Anyone who could could crack that nut can make billions. Um, I don't think there is any such equation. And the, the conventional wisdom hasn't been, you know, just look at real rates. That's all that matters. You know, clearly there are times when it doesn't matter. There's there's moments of extreme political uncertainty. You know, wars can make gold move regardless of what's having happening with interest rates and so on. But but real interest rates have been credited with being the most explanatory variable over the decades since the dollar became a floating abstraction in 1971. And um, and in the past, that correlation was there. Uh, but it, it's been, you know, conventional wisdom so long that, frankly, you know, mea culpa, I never went back and checked on it for a long time. And when I did, I found that the relationship is really broke down. And in fact, nominal rates have a, have a higher correlation with the gold dollar exchange ratio now than real rates. And you know, maybe with all these experiments with negative interest rates, the governments around the world have been experimenting with and all the crazy stuff done since 2008. Maybe that's no big surprise. We've been in financially uncharted waters. And, you know, I, I'm old enough that to me, 2008 seems recent. You know, <laughs> that's the last big crash. But, you know, 2008, we're, we're looking at 15 years now. You know, that is, a you know, for a 50 year track record, 15 years is a large chunk so if the rules change for that 50, 15 out of 50, five, zero years, you know, that's quite significant. The surprising part of all this, I guess I'm not incredibly surprised to see that things change. The surprising thing is that I've received almost no response to this. I mean, this is the conventional wisdom. And when I published it, I put a question mark after my research, like, tell me why I'm wrong. All you experts out there who keep quoting, you know, the conventional wisdom and saying real rates are the main thing you need to look at. Tell me what I've missed. You know, look at these charts where, you know, the correlation is higher for the nominal 10 year and the two year um, than for real rates. Any of them. Pick your pick your real rate. So what's going on? And, and the only response, of course, it had to be from Rick Rule. It was uh, we should discuss. And we haven't had that opportunity yet, but I'm looking forward to it. So <clears throat> takeaways. One is not a, you know, therefore buy this or invest that, sorry. But one is just, therefore beware. If you are one of these people who assumes that, you know, just look at real rates and that's the main thing you need to know, uh, you can go to my website, independentspeculator.com. It's a free article out there. Um, on the, recently on, I'm not sure what keyword you'd look for, but real rates would be one of them. Uh, anyway, and so look at look at that data and reconsider your premises at the very least. 
Other things would be, uh, you know, we have higher correlations with nominal rates. And uh, if I'm right about the recession, there are a lot of people out there that have been burned because they've been calling for the Fed pivot. And else economic data comes in uh, that looks stronger than expected, right? The labor report keeps coming in stronger than expected. And so the people calling for the for the Powell pivot are, are, are losing ground to team soft landing right now. But my version of that is not, oh, the Fed's going to beat inflation and everything's going to be fine and therefore they can ease up on the brakes. No, my version is that the Fed is breaking things. B-R-E-A-K, not B-R-A-K-E. And, and it's going to break more things. You know, the, the people who think that the banking crisis you and I spoke about the last time we were on air together, people think, oh, that's it. It's safe to get back in the water. The, the Fed broke something and it wasn't so bad. Hey, hey, happy days again. I don't think that's it at all. I, I don't think you go from basically nothing to raising 500 basis points at a record rate without a lot more going off. Uh, just for one example that I'm not the only one mentioning is commercial real estate. So I think more things are going to break. And I think the Fed will pivot, not because it's beaten inflation, but because systemic risk rears its head. You know, they're not going to admit, oh, it's just because of recession. They're going to say, oh, well, there's systemic risk here. So we, we can't afford to let this go. Um, but that means, uh, if I'm right, you know, I don't know the future. But if I'm right, that means rates will go down, real and nominal. And that's fundamentally still a very strong positive correlation for gold. And, you know, never mind that fundamental economics, just think about the psychology. You've got the Fed pivoting with inflation still high, looks like the 70s, smells like the 70s. You've got, you know, higher oil prices at the same time. You've got a war. I mean, the storium here is is pretty strong too. It is a very strong story, and I think, um, as you mentioned, with a Fed pivot, it seems like we're probably going to see more inflation. And I know you've mentioned this before that really gold doesn't respond to inflation. It also it really anticipates inflation more than anything. So could that be the reason why we're seeing a sustained uh, high gold price, even though you know real rates have have fallen in the recent months? That's a very interesting question. I've been thinking about this a bit. I know like it's a common thing for guests on shows to say interesting question while they think rapidly of an answer. But I actually have been thinking about this quite a bit. Um, uh, my my friend and fellow uh, gold bug, uh, Adrian Day, who lives here in Puerto Rico, we get together from time to time and discuss markets and things. And we were both looking at this uh, last week. And we're trying to figure out, you know, gold's got a real bit here. And who is it? You know, it's hard to imagine that it's, you know, mainstream investors or Wall Street uh, institutions. The easiest answer would be central banks. And that has been clearly a, a major tailwind for gold. It's been a big boost over the last year, all this record central bank buying. Um, so so when it looks like we've got headwinds, I mean, the, the, the reversal in the dollar that you and I spoke of late last year, you know, that played out more or less the way I thought it would. And it was very good for gold earlier this year. But that's kind of fallen apart now. And with the EU um, posting uh, not just much lower than expected inflation numbers, they're also posting uh, you know, other signs of economic weakness that could have them ease up. And therefore, the relative hawkishness of central banks balance changes, right? So there's, there's headwinds for gold right now. You know, other things, not other things being equal, if I just look at the headlines, if I look at the economic data, I'm actually short-term bearish on gold. I mean, I, I'm not bearish on gold, but like over the, the immediate month ahead or two uh, until the brown stuff hits the fan again, it, the, the data don't really look supportive for higher gold prices. And yet here we go. We're still back around 2000 as you and I speak. There's no real news today, but it's up. Um, while the markets have been fluctuating up and down in the red, you know, the big news on the markets right now is Apple and their very expensive VR headset. That's got nothing to do with gold. Um, so who's buying? It's an easy answer to say central banks. Uh -huh. uh, but we don't know that, you know, and we won't know that until later. And even when we think we know that, you know, when the World Gold Council tells us, oh, record central bank buying. Well, how do they know? Well, they know because they go with the IMF reports. Well, how does the IMF know? 
Well, they call Russia and China and say, well, what did you, what did you buy? You know, and you believe those guys? I don't, you know, so, uh, you know, who knows what's uh, what the actual central bank gold buying is. I'm not sure I'm helping you or the audience very much here, Elijah, but the truth is I'd rather say I don't know and I don't right now. So uh, near term chaotic, I would expect based on the economic data for, for the near term to provide buying opportunities in gold. And I am pleased, surprised, but pleased to see that gold has held up better than I expected in these circumstances. And and if anything, you know, I, I don't want to give you more clickbait headlines here, Elijah, but if anything, that makes me even more bullish for when the other shoe drops on the economy. You know, if we have this much of a bid now, imagine what happens. Yes, imagine, right? imagine, but imagine what happens when, when the fundamentals uh, turn bullish again. You know, interesting times, Elijah. Definitely interesting times. It'll be interesting to continue to track this with you. Before we let you go, Alobo, where can our viewers find you online? And did you have any last thoughts for our viewers? People know where to find me, independentspeculator.com, the free weekly digest. If you sign up for that, we will not spam you to death. But let me give you something else to take away here. And that is there's going to be a whole lot of hype now about, you know, as I see it, the Fed's Hamlet question, looking at the skull, to skip or not to skip. That is the question. Um I don't know. Nobody knows. But I think the Fed, you know, my gut is that they're likely to pull off this skip thing. That's why they're talking about it. That's why they're signaling it. And the idea is a, is a hawkish pause, right? You know, we're not really pausing. We're not starting. We still got more work to do, putting other people out of work. That's our work. Um, but I think they know as well as I that, uh, you know, the unintended consequences and the breakage from what they've done already is serious. So the, the takeaway isn't, oh, I think they're going to skip. The takeaway is skip or not, they're going to sound as hawkish as they can. I suspect that we will get the hawkish skip. And I suspect that that skip will turn into the pause. You know, they're trying to ease into it without unleashing irrational exuberance. But never mind all that stuff. The, the takeaway is whether they do or they don't, it doesn't matter. What they've done already, I think, I may be wrong, but my view is that what they've already done is enough to break more stuff. And I think if you look beyond the headline numbers, even in the employment reports, if you look beyond the headline numbers, you know, the last one, big growth in government, that was the biggest gain in employment, you know, big employment beat. Well, yeah, if the government goes out and hires a bunch of people to go and make the rest of the economy less efficient. Yeah, that's a beat if you want to call it that. So, so yeah, it just, I think, you know, whatever happens in the near term, volatility, noise, don't let it scare you. Don't let it panic you. Don't let it shake you out. Uh, and I'm not saying someday, five years from now, we'll all be happy that I, you know, I said this. I'm saying that by the end of this year, I'll either be right or I'll be wrong. Uh, I think I'll be right. And it's my intention to use any volatility in the near term to buy. And that would be gold, silver, uranium, nothing else right now. All right, Lobo Tigro, once again, thank you so much for your time and you have a great weekend and God bless. Thank you, Elijah. Miles Franklin Precious Metals is one of America's oldest and most trusted bullion dealers. Miles Franklin is a rated and accredited by the Better Business Bureau, licensed and bonded, and has zero complaints ever registered. Here at Liberty and Finance, we are licensed brokers with Miles Franklin. To order, simply call us. Discuss your needs and we can let you know our live inventory, prices and availability. And lock in your order over the phone. Once your order is locked, the price is held for you regardless of market fluctuations. And the metals are reserved for you awaiting your settled payment. Within one business day of ordering, you will receive an email invoice detailing the order and payment instructions. Miles Franklin accepts payments by bank wire, ACH or electronic check money order, check mailed priority mail, and cryptocurrency. The fastest forms of payment are bank wire and cryptocurrency. Upon settled payment, metals will ship out within three to five business days. You will receive tracking information via email. Domestic shipping charges are $15 for any order under 500 ounces of silver or 10 ounces of gold. For orders larger than that, domestic shipping is free. The package will be boxed, fully insured, and labeled discreetly with no indication of the contents inside. For your privacy, the name Miles Franklin will not even be on the package. 
to talk to myself Kaiser, my brother Elijah, or my father Dunnigan, call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237.